and welcome to The Watchmen. Last week we brought you part one of the powerful story of Irving Roth, a Holocaust survivor who overcame unbelievable odds to become an internationally recognized author and lecturer. Now, when we left off last week, it was quite a cliffhanger. Irving was describing the horrific death march that he and other prisoners were forced to endure at the hands of the Nazis. Again, this was a death march. The name says it all. Yet Irving made it out alive against all odds. How did he do it? And what has his life been like after the Holocaust? What's his message for the world today? Here's the conclusion of our incredible conversation with one of the most courageous men I have ever met, Irving Roth. Hunger, long hours, and that. Will you live another day? But I'm alive and we're marching out on the 18th of January, uh, ostensibly to work. But we're not working, going that way. We're marching away. Away from Auschwitz, away from the Russian army. For three days. Something referred to as a death march. What it meant, if you slowed down, you were dead. Because we are under guard. So you're hungry, you're tired. By the way, January in Poland is cold. And we are not wearing seven layers or silk underwear to keep us warm like to at skiing. So we have this longish coat. That's the outer garment underneath that. There may be a shirt and wooden shoes. Very uncomfortable, by the way. After three days, we put into a train, open cars. Hours go by, we wind up in a new place called Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a concentration camp, which means really that it did not have a gas chamber. But Buchenwald was built in 1937 for about 5,000 inmates. When I arrived there, there were 50,000. And I'd imagine that death march, many people didn't make it to Buchenwald. Yes, thousands, thousands. There were other places they went too. They were just gunned down. They were gunned down. You slowed down and you were dead. But this time, if you were lucky at age 15, if you're tall enough and all that, maybe you're still alive. If you're 60, you're not alive. So Buchenwald had no food in terms of regularly get, getting something for breakfast, something for lunch, something as you did in Auschwitz. You got some black coffee in the morning, get some soup at noon and a piece of bread at night. Here, if you got a boiled potato every second or third day, you are very lucky. And of course, people die. But I'm trying to stay alive. I'm with my brother, so he gives me encouragement. He was a great believer in God, and he would pray every day. And I used to tell him, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I, you know, he would say, pray. Don't concentrate on your physical being. Concentrate on your emotional and spiritual being. So it was very helpful, actually. But one day he's taken away. I'm alone. I know the war is coming to an end because we know that. And we hope to maybe survive. And then death marches begin again. And I keep hiding. On the 10th of April. You were hiding to avoid. To march. avoid being a death march. Because I knew what a death march is. And I knew I can't make it. I'm down to 75 pounds. You had that will to live. The will to live. So I keep hiding. It's the 10th of April. I'm hiding under a building, a crawl space. With a few other guys young kids, because in this barracks were all kids, 15-year-olds, maybe somebody 16. A guard comes along with a dog, and the dog begins to bark, of course, and he knows, and he fires a few shots into the air. He says, get out or I'll fire underneath. So we crawl out. We're standing in front of the gate in Buchenwald. And I know that after a day, I'll be dead. A miracle. 
as we're standing there, the siren goes off. There's an air raid. American airplanes are overhead. American airplanes are bombing Weimar, which is the capital of the German Republic, at one time. So the guards obviously are not going to be outside being exposed, particularly marching with a column of people. The guys from up there will look down and see this column of, column of people. They think probably they're, they're uh, soldiers, so they're going to bomb it or come down and swoop and strafe it. So they wait. That day, the air raid lasted all day long. I survived another day. Next morning, Things weren't moving as they move usually, you know, counting us and all that. By 11 o'clock, every single guard disappeared. There was no one in a uniform. They all disappeared. And 3 o'clock in the afternoon on April 11th, 1945, two American soldiers walked into our barracks. Two healthy battle-hardened soldiers walked into our barracks and saw 15-year-olds emaciated, skeletons shuffling along. These two guys broke down. But they also knew they had to do something. When you see emaciated bodies, the answer to a soldier is, feed them. So off they went. And uh, within an hour or two, brought down vats of food. The American commander now takes over, and the first thing he did within a matter of a few days, he says, first we have to take care of the kids. Took us out of there, past the warehouse of German army uniform. So we got all undressed, disinfected, and now we're marching along outside of this warehouse, all German army uniforms, into a building outside of the camp. We're assigned into rooms. Now I'm no longer sleeping on this shelf, these wooden planks. I now have my own bed. There are three other guys in my room with their own beds. We get fed three times a day. And the Americans were very kind, the liberators. In addition to giving us just food three times a day, they also decided for the kids to give them chocolate. So bars of chocolate. And so I'm alive and I gain weight and the war is over for me on the 11th of April, but the rest of the, hum the, rest of the human race in Europe on the, 11th, on the 8th of May. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I'm alone, I'm 15 years old, I'm in the middle of Germany. Coming up, he escaped the Holocaust with his life, but what about his family? Irving Roth goes in search of his parents, up next, right here on The Watchmen.